All right. Soundy sound, video, video. Hi! It's Professor Gallucci again. Getting a little punchy doing too many of these in a row. Uh, welcome to week three, part two for PS 101, Introduction to Astronomy, Summer Online Course. Um, this is, oops, back up one. Uh, properties of stars, um, or another way, of, uh, we're going to be covering spectra, looking at some more things we can learn about stars from their light. So up to this point, we've talked about how bright stars are, how to figure out their brightness using distance, um, the, how to figure out their temperature from their color or the thermal radiation curve. Uh, right, and using those um, to start to make some estimates about size of stars. Uh, now we're going to take that light and we're going to break it up like through a prism and look at the spectrum. Uh, I showed you a little bit of that in the last video. We're going to talk about the different types of spectra that can be produced, um, specifically three basic types of spectra, um, which are used in co uh, combination or a combination of these three types uh, are used all throughout astronomy for understanding what uh, things are made of in the universe. So the first type of spectrum is a continuous spectrum. Continuous spectrum gives off light at every wavelength. We're just showing the visible light spectrum here, but you can imagine it goes into the infrared and the radio and the ultraviolet and uh, my brain stopped. Ultraviolet, X-ray, gamma ray. Um, but it's a continuous spectrum. It's giving off wavelengths at all colors. All, sorry, giving off light at all colors, all wavelengths. Thermal radiation is one type, creates one type of a continuous spectrum. When we talk about stars specifically, we're generally talking about thermal radiation. Um, so a hot source or hot is anything with a temperature that's greater than zero Kelvin, absolute zero. Uh, is going to give off that thermal spectrum. It's going to give off a continuous spectrum. An example, incandescent light bulb. Don't know how many of us still have incandescent light bulbs in our house, houses, but glass bulb inside, there's a little wire filament, gets really, really hot and glows when it's hot. Uh, that will give off a continuous spectrum. Um, spans all wavelengths without interruption. Hot source, solid, dense gas, like the core of a star, but not all of a star. Another type of spectrum is an emission line spectrum. This is given off. Um, I love that I can edit these while we're going. Um, this gives off certain specific wavelengths or bright lines in their spectrum. Uh, this is typically given off by a thin or low density cloud of gas. It only emits specific wavelengths. Um, these wavelengths depend on uh, the composition and temperature of the gas producing these bright lines in ways we'll talk about next, in the next section. The abs an absorption line spectrum, we've already seen an example of this for the sun uh, or for a star. It looks like a continuous spectrum almost. It's got all these colors, but it's missing a few. There are dark lines, uh, absorption lines in that spectrum. That is typically made when you have a hot source, like your tungsten filament in your light bulb or the core of a star. That light gives off continuous spectrum, passes through a cool gas of some sort, and the light we see through that gas has these gaps. It's missing. Uh, another example of a type of source, the hot source can be the core of a star. The cool gas could be the outer layers of the star. So when we look at that star, we get an absorption spectrum. These three are all related. This is the entire figure that I used to cut up to get the previous slides. You can have a hot source. It's like is a continuous spectrum. You can pass that continuous spectrum through a cool gas. Uh, cool meaning cooler than the hot source uh, to get that absorption line spectrum. Or if you look at the gas cloud just chilling all by itself, it'll give off um, these emission lines. Some real life examples that I have pictures of here. Um, here's an example of um, a continuous spectrum. It looks like a continuous spectrum. It's not 100% quite, but it's close. Uh, continuous spectrum from a, a white light, a white light source. Uh, here is an example of an emission spectrum. 
for uh, different types of lights. These are the fluorescent lights that most of us are replacing our incandescent lights with. Um, fluorescent lights uh, are more energy efficient, yay, uh, but they don't give off a continuous spectrum. They have gases in them that give off these specific uh, emission lines when mixed together uh, look, look white. And you can get the warm lights that are more reddish, the cool lights that are more blue based on what's inside. Uh, emission lines, uh, here is, this is showing uh, some sample emission lines for different elements on the periodic table. Um, this showing the whole color background so you have, can kind of see where in the color spectrum it is, but these bright lines indicate the bright emission lines you would see. When we observe emission lines, um, interestingly, they don't look like that necessarily. If we took an image through a filter that looks at one specific line that hydrogen has, you can see these uh, fancy gas clouds, which are very bright with respect to that line, that emission line. Really helpful if you're in a location with lots of light pollution. I mentioned that last time. Because um, you could filter out all the other junk light you don't want and just get that little skinny emission line that the universe likes to give off. This uh, spectrum, this is a spectrum of the sun. It's uh, a very detailed spectrum of the sun. It's actually wrapping from the top, uh, all of, you know, left to right. You imagine that all of these stripes would make one huge long rainbow. Um, but this is a very fine detailed spectrum. Uh, and you see the black or the dark lines where there is an absorption line. So this is an absorption spectrum from a, the sun. So highlights here, uh, when you're looking at your objects, if you're working on the worksheets with this, this is worksheet six, um, pairs along with reading six as well. Dense objects give off continuous spectrum, diffuse gases give off emission spectrum. Put a dense object behind a diffuse cloud, you get an absorption spectrum. Those are your three main types. Now what makes these spectral lines? Why are they important? Why are they cool? These spectral lines tell us about the substance that the gas um, is made of. Uh, we're gonna focus specifically on atomic structure and lines that show atomic structure, but just something to keep in the back of your head for funsies. Um, we can tell structure of molecules this way too, particularly with radio light. But we're gonna focus on kind of visible, near visible, and atoms. Very simple, simple, simple model of an atom. You have uh, the nucleus here with protons and neutrons. Um, you have various orbits around the um, nucleus where the electrons can live. What's interesting about an atom, so this kind of looks like a really simple planetary model, but what makes an atom different from planets going around the sun Planets, first of all, move in ellipses. This shows a circle, but it's not that it's it's not that simple. But what we can pretend it's a circle for this for this uh, course. Uh, the electron has to appear on one of these levels. It can't be in between. So the electron can jump between levels, but it can never be uh, can jump from one level to another, but it can never be in between them. Interestingly. Using that model, we see how an atom can give off light or absorb light. Uh, here is an example of absorption of light. This little wiggly line usually means light. That's a Greek letter gamma, which we sometimes use to mean frequency, which we associate with light. The little squiggle of light comes to the atom, gives the atom energy. Remember, light, energy, light has energy. Um, gives the electron energy and can pop it up to a higher, higher level or higher energy state. Sucks in light, makes the electron go up. Uh, in another case, you could have the electron come down and since it's going from a higher level to a lower level, it's giving off energy. It gives it off in terms of light, a photon, a bit of light. Um, so absorption of light, light is absorbed uh, when electrons move up and emitted or given off when electrons move down. 
Uh, another great analogy that a student came up with last year uh, was going uh, a rock on a hill. A rock will roll downhill and give off energy, but you have to give it energy to push it up that hill. So you have to give the electron light to push it up to a higher level. These levels aren't just arbitrary distances. They um, correspond to energies. It's the energy of the electron in its orbit. Um, although these diagrams are showing the circular orbit, you can kind of flatten it out and pretend like um, it's steps. Like if this is the lowest step, because the electron's never in the nucleus. This is the first step, this is the second step. Uh, this is showing first step, second step, third step. You can flatten that out and imagine them as steps. As the electron moves to higher levels, it has more energy. Ground state is the lowest level it can be in. All the states above that are called excited states. Again, the electron can jump from one state to another, go up, it can go down, so those two are allowed. It can't go in the middle. It can't go in between energies, interestingly enough. Again, the weird way in which quantum physics uh, runs the world at tiny, tiny, tiny scales is what's behind that. Uh, but the electron has to live in one of these energy levels. So for example, you can draw an energy level diagram for an element such as hydrogen. Hydrogen's pretty simple, proton, and the nucleus, maybe a neutron, maybe not, an electron orbiting around that nucleus. When the electron is in the lowest state, closest to the nucleus that it can be, it's considered the ground state. That is associated with a certain amount of energy. The next level up, the next level higher is associated with a higher energy. The next level up is an even higher energy. And as you see, the levels get higher, the energy, amount of energy of that atom gets higher, um, but the difference between the energy levels gets smaller. And eventually you hit a breaking point where the electron is just gone. It's, it's so far away that it's not orbiting anymore. It's considered um, not part of the atom anymore. We call that being ionized. So if the electron can bounce from here to here, there's a certain energy difference. There's an amount of energy it takes to move from here to here. That's shown by this blue line here, all the way on the left side. If you jump from the first level to right to the third level, that's another energy difference. And then the next level is another energy difference. These blue lines are showing how much energy it takes going in to uh, make that jump. The next set, you could have the electron on the second one and go up or down between the second level. Again, these red lines are showing, um, excuse me, those red lines are, sh are lining up with those energy level differences. Uh, I don't, uh, maybe these are, I'm not 100% sure these colors match these colors, but what this is trying to show, this is showing an electromagnetic spectrum, uh, wavelength, uh, excuse me, frequencies from, high, uh, let's say short wavelength, so ultraviolets over here, through visible, through infrared. Um, can't read it, it's super tiny. Don't worry about it. Uh, I'll show you a better example next. This is showing the energy differences between levels correspond to wavelengths of specific wavelengths of light. So each of these lines here corresponds to a different you know, line on this chart. So an energy difference here corresponds to a photon or a bit of light with a certain amount of energy, which means there's a certain wavelength, so it goes somewhere on the spectrum. So hydrogen has a certain set of energy levels, which produces a certain set of lines. That's its fingerprint. That's its specific, um, that's its specific code in terms of its electromagnetic spectrum. Now, this is a wide range of infrared, optical, ultraviolet. We're gonna focus in on the visible in a second. So moving on from this, we're gonna zoom in on just the visible part of the spectrum. This is what we see for hydrogen in the visible part of the spectrum. 
Uh, it has emission lines. It has emission lines, one that's red, one that's kind of teal, and one that's blue-violet. There's another violet one. It's very faint. Not everyone can see it. We'll count it as part of the visible spectrum for now. When an electron jumps down between two energy levels, remember it gives off that photon. It gives off that light. These are the specific wavelengths that hydrogen gives off. Go back to this section. I am pretty sure it's this little grouping right here is the visible lines. Um, as you can see, there are some, there are some, um, there are more because you have these infinite numbers of levels here. But in reality, only a few of them actually show up. So this is the distinct pattern of emission for hydrogen gas. We have a cloud of hydrogen gas that is chilling out and is warm enough that it's giving off light. It's going to give off these specific wavelengths. When you merge all these wavelengths together, it's going to look kind of pinkish. Um, for a while, I had pink hair, and I called it my hydrogen hair. Um, when you mix these colors of light together, you get pink. Um, but when you put it through a spectrograph or a prism, you can actually see the distinct lines. Now, this is for emission. Now, what happens if I put a cloud of hydrogen in front of an incandescent light bulb or some other thermal continual source? This is what you see. Notice the difference between the two. Instead of the, I'm pointing at the screen, instead of the <laughs> photon light coming away from the atom, the light's going into the atom. And instead of having a dark background where these bright lines show up, you have a bright background. All the colors given off by that light bulb, that thermal source behind it, and the dark lines of absorption from that hydrogen cloud. Now the hydrogen's taking the light from the thing behind it and absorbing it and using it to make its atoms higher energy. So the light that you see coming out has some dark lines. They may not be perfectly dark, but they're usually pretty dark. Um, so if you looked at a simple plot of how that looks, you have a star, it uh, gives off a uh, light. This is the star's atmosphere. Oh, or sorry, this is actually a slightly different example from looking at a planet. If you have a continuous source back here, um, it's got its own absorption lines we're going to ignore for now because they're not super strong. And you stick a planet in front of it, and you look at the sunlight as it goes through the planet's atmosphere, and it's saying this is a sodium-rich atmosphere. You put it through your spectrograph, your prism, you get your absorption line spectrum. What I really wanted to show you with this is just like we did before, this rainbow spectrum is pretty, but not super useful in a scientific sense. We want to know how much energy there is in each wavelength of color, of light. So you flip the rainbow on its side and you get a graph that has wavelength. It doesn't have the axes on here, but wavelength on the x-axis, intensity or brightness on the y-axis. You can see there's a lot of light in all these things. All these little tiny things are little tiny absorption lines, and you get these big honking lines here. Um, that match up with sodium. So the highlights of this is that electrons orbit atoms in specific energy levels. As electrons move up and down levels, the atom will absorb, absorb or give off energy in the form of light. And the size of that energy jump corresponds to the energy or wavelength or frequency of that light. So how do we use that light to analyze spectra? We've got a couple things going on. We've got, we've got this thermal continuum. We've got this, these spectral lines. We've got all kinds of funky stuff. We want to use all that information together um, to figure out some properties about the star. But we don't want to get confused between them. So first of all, temperature. Best way to learn temperature uh, is to look at that thermal radiation. Find where the peak is. That peak. The wavelength or color of light where that peaks tells you what the temperature is. You've got to look at that thermal curve, um, particularly if you're working on these worksheets, to find the temperature. The spectrum, as we just looked at, uh, tells you what your object is made of, what the gas is made of. So this is the absorption lines of hydrogen. This specific pattern matches hydrogen. If you see this specific pattern of lines, you know you've got hydrogen present. Um, this is showing a bunch of different things. So here's hydrogen with that red line, that teal line. 
uh, they put that in purple and that one's practically in the ultraviolet. Um, this is showing the absorption lines and very skinny, you can barely see the emission lines for hydrogen. Helium has a different set of energy levels. Also, it has two electrons. So it's got more lines and it's got different lines. Oxygen, more complex, also has different lines. Sodium, sodium actually has two strong lines in the yellow and some in the violet and that's about it. Uh, mercury, uh, liquid mercury, uh, if you could uh, get get that into a gaseous state and look at the absorption spectrum you get that uh, neon argon all those gases you think of uh, making neon signs they um, have ridiculous amount of lines in them so because each element has a special fingerprint that you can look at a spectrum and look at all the lines in the spectrum and start to pick out oh this line is hydrogen this line is from helium Here's an uh, example from some stars, excuse me. And they've just kind of labeled these with letters. Don't worry about that. You can see they, they've lab they started labeling some of the hydrogen lines. So hydrogen alpha, there's that red line. Hydrogen beta, that's the teal one. It's not even in this star. Um, it's in this, uh, I forget what comes next on the alphabet. Um, a couple more hydrogen lines, and then all these other lines. So astronomers had to go through and match these patterns of lines and match the wavelengths of these lines to the different things that you have, uh, could have in a star spectrum. Again, here's the sun spectrum, all stretched out. There are a lot of lines here. There are a lot of absorption lines because there's actually a lot of different stuff in the sun. Um, the sun is primarily made of hydrogen, and a whole bunch of helium after that. However, the tiny trace amounts of everything else in the sun uh, actually shows up in the spectrum of the atmosphere um, and tells us that the sun is made up of a lot of the same stuff that we are made of and our planet is made of. Things like calcium and potassium and magnesium are all present in this spectrum. So when you put these two together and flip it on its side, this is showing the spectrum, spectra, plural, of several different stars. Notice the letters on the side, O, B, A, F, G, K, M. We learned those for the temperature spectral types. The stars can be classified by their temperature. As you see, the hottest ones at the top, the coolest ones at the bottom. And this is only showing part of the spectrum, the visible part of the spectrum, and it's kind of flattened, so you can't quite see, but you can see that the O stars are still rising as you get to ultraviolet. So they peak in the ultraviolet. So do B stars. Uh, A stars are starting to creep back into the peak of the spectrum being in the visible. G, we're a G5, so we're right about this one. They actually peak, you can kind of tell it's a little rounded. Peaks right here. These M stars, these cool stars, they keep going up near the end, so they peak in the infrared. This is just a little slice of this here, right? So this was, these are several cooler stars, stars cooler than the sun. It's just looking at a little slice. Can I, oh no, it's gonna move it. Uh, a little slice of that thermal spectrum. So you don't see the whole thing, you don't always see the peak, but you can see where it's going and you can identify the lines. It also turns out that the temperature of a star determines which lines are going to be stronger than other lines. We're not going to worry about that level of detail, but if you notice, there's a wide range of temperatures over which you can see these particular strong lines. Those are from hydrogen, because there's a lot of hydrogen in stars. Um, there's a lot of hydrogen in these stars too, but the temperature in the atmosphere is just not quite right to make it give off those particular lines or absorb the, the, those particular lines. You start to see some other, you start to see molecules and some weird stuff. But all these little dips, all these little dips in these spectra are due to different elements, um, absorption lines. So the pattern of absorption lines really can't tell you color, uh, so excuse me, really can't tell you temperature, um, especially if you're looking at it in a two-dimensional spectrum like this. Uh, but it will tell you, the locations of those dark lines will tell you what it's made of. To get the temperature, 
looking at this plot is not going to be super useful. You really want to turn it on its side and look and see where the peak is. Uh, that'll give you a better idea. So the highlights for this, absorption lines tell us the composition of stars. The peak of the black body curve tells us the temperature of stars. And if you are an astronomer that does this a lot, uh, you can get a rough estimate of the temperature just by looking at where the lines are, but that takes a whole lot of practice to do. Um, primarily, we're going to use that in this course to the lines to tell us the composition, not the temperature. All right, I will see you on the discussion boards. Um, yes, see you there.